Yeah. Man, we're going to celebrate communion shortly, but I want to share a message with you at that time. I think um, we all need to hear from time to time. There was a, a movie in 1983 uh, called The Morning After Things, The Day After It's Gone, uh, starring Jason Robards. It was really uh, quite a movie in the sense that it was a nuclear attack on the United States. And then what happens after that nuclear attack? How do people cope with the devastation, the uh, radiological fallout, and so on and so forth? And it was, a, it was way back in the day, in 83, but it got people's attention what it would be like to have that and uh, how people would, uh, would just deal with uh, the eventuality of the day after a nuclear attack. Well, in a strange way, I kind of looked at that and I thought about what happened at the day of Pentecost, uh, 50 days after the resurrection, and what, what it must have been like from there to have seen the explosion of the church, if you will. Uh, remember, there was only 120 people that were invited to the upper room in Jerusalem by Jesus. He said, I want you to gather in Jerusalem, tarry there until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and uh, you shall receive power, he said. So there was this massive explosion that happened there. And uh, 120, uh, after Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that there were 3,000 souls saved on that day. So all of a sudden, you get a, a church that went from 120 people to 3,120 people all in one day. Now just imagine that for a minute. You don't see that kind of church growth anywhere in America or anywhere else for that matter. So all of a sudden, 120 people <clears throat> become 3,120 people. And some historians um, estimate that church may have got to 10,000 within the month. And so that's huge growth uh, within that, that um, period of time. All of a sudden the Holy Spirit falls on the early believers, they're all filled with the Spirit, they spill it into the streets of Jerusalem, uh, on fire for God, and Peter pre preaches an amazing sermon and all those folks get saved. Well, I wonder what the day after was like. How did they cope with all of that? How, how do you, now, do you just remember something? Yeah, we have got structure, we've got a, a, a consistory, a lot of them is a church council, Presbyterians of elders, Baptists of deacons, Lutherans of what they have, and the members of what they have, hierarchical government, and, and well oiled, well organized machines. That church in, in, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee was the, was the slickest operation that we've ever, ever seen. It was seamless. Multiple huge staff, I mean, the video presentations, the music, the whole thing was just, it was not a glitch at all. But they're well organized, they've got a lot of paid people doing that, you know, paid a lot of money to make sure the audiovisual stuff is just perfect, all the ministries work perfectly, you know, to try and just wrangle 5,000 people on a Sunday morning in a parking lot is so an effort just in itself. But the other church didn't have any of that. They had some guys who were followers of Jesus, who were disciples, apostles. That's it. There were no ushers, there were no elders per se, there were no paid staff, there was no buildings, there didn't have any buildings to worship in other than the synagogues that they went to. So what do you do with 3,120 people? Well here's the interesting thing. Oh well, by the way, they had a very simple statement of faith. We have very complicated uh, statements of doctrine, don't we? I mean, have you ever read the Westminster Confession or the Heidelberg Confession? There's law, huge statements of faith. And their statement of faith was simple. Jesus is Lord, he's risen from the dead, and you can be saved by repenting and putting your faith and trust in him. That was it. That was it. That's what, that, what their message, message was. Peter's message on the day of Pentecost was repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus. What it was. Very simple message. And these people were all different. Some came from different backgrounds, different opinions, different races, different origins, different language, different speech, different social status. I mean, what a headache to try to organize 3,120 people and then some more on day one. Well, here's the interesting thing. The Bible, the book of Acts, says this, that the church continued to grow and believers were added daily, and there was not a needy person among them. Now think about that for a minute. All of a sudden you get 3,000 to 
maybe three and a half, then to four, then to five. Continue to grow day by day, and there was not a single needy person among them. Because all the rest of them took care of their needs. There was no organized benevolence fund. People just cared for each other out of the goodness of their heart, out of their love for the Lord. But there was a major element that was present in those believers that was not there before. Now remember what they come through. They'd seen Jesus being arrested, they'd seen Jesus being crucified. They were scared, they were running all over the place. <clears throat> then there was the resurrection, then he left again and said, wait in Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And, and so all of a sudden, on that day of Pentecost, those timid, scared, apprehensive believers became radicals. They were on fire with the Holy Spirit, the presence of Christ on them. But there was an element that was present now that wasn't there before. It wasn't just power, it was peace. They knew the peace of the Lord. And that peace continued to grow, even as opposition to this new religion, this new cult in the mind of the Jews and the Romans, continued to grow. We read about it a few chapters later in the book of Acts, chapter 9, <clears throat> and it says this, Then the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase in numbers. So what is it that keeps a church together? What is it that keeps a diverse people together from all different sectors of the community? You ever wonder why the Apostle Paul, at the beginning of just about all of his letters, wrote two words? Grace. What was that one? Grace and peace. Grace and peace to you. I ever wonder why we say, peace be with you? Why? It's because peace is vital to the health of any person, in any church, in any society, in any country. It's so important that Apostle Paul mentioned it again in Ephesians 4. He said, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to do that. To maintain peace within your congregation. Peace is part of the fruit, as you well know, of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. The word peace occurs nearly 429 times in the Bible. And so it's important for us to understand the power and the importance of peace. In fact, peace is one of the strongest desires for human beings. We all want peace, right? We want peace in the world. We want peace in our country. We want peace in our churches. We want, <clears throat> we want peace at home. We want peace in our marriages. We want peace in our relationships. We strive for it, but sometimes it's so hard to find and so hard to get. And then when we get it, it's so hard to maintain. That's one of the strongest human desires, whether it's peace in nations, peace between neighbors, peace in our own mind. And sometimes that's the hardest place to find peace, is in our own mind, rather than in the world. All over the last few years, we experienced unprecedented global anxiety, war in Ukraine. With Russia, uh, war between Israel and Hamas, tension that we have with China, with North Korea, with Iran, and then we have unrest here in the United States, uh, racial unrest, uh, anti Semitism is continually on the rise, uh, political unrest, we just saw the attempted assassination of a former president last week, and uh, that's just part of the unrest political, politically. There's so much. Animosity, so much hostility, I think there's all between the various parties. And the social unrest, rest between social and religious um, conservatives and woke pro progressives. There's a lot of that going on. Just heard a bunch of it that uh, just recently with some local church. Then there's personal tension, isn't it? People are stressed about the economy, inflation, gas prices. Turmoil in the family, people just don't get along between husbands and wives, parents and their kids. Then there's turmoil at work, turmoil in their relationships, their health. The list goes on and on and 
on and on. And it's almost like peace is on some other planet that we just can't reach. When we want to, it's like a golden ring, a brass ring, we can't just grab. But it's there somewhere, we really need it, we really want it. And I know there's people sitting here and people probably watching this that are going, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Whether it's in here, peace of mind, or whether it's peace in my family, my marriage, my relationships, whether it's peace in my community, peace in my church, peace, I just can't seem to find it. And when I find it, I just can't seem to keep it. In Philippians uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul makes these words. He says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You just can't work it out. There are things in my life when I shouldn't have had peace in my heart at all. I mean, turmoil. I mean, distress. I mean, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And you start to pray, and all of a sudden, the peace of God fills your heart and mind, and you have no idea where it came from because you didn't do it before. It's like supernatural peace. Some of you experienced that when you've lost loved ones. That you should have been a mess, but all of a sudden, God's peace comes on your, your heart. And you know it's well with your soul, and maybe with the soul of your lost loved one. So there are times in our life that peace is supernaturally given to us. But there are times it's not. Because there are times that peace is not automatic. It doesn't just happen. You've got to work at it. Remember Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 4. He says this, make every effort. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Hebrews 12, 14 says this, work at, work at living in peace with everyone. There's no adage that says, uh, to live below, to live above with saints we love, well, that would be glory. But to live below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. And sometimes it's hard to get on with Christians because we're all got differing opinions. One of the things I've noticed about being up here is one of the biggest problems is people just don't like change at all. Even good change. It's like it changes the enemy. Uh, let me give you a, a, a word of a, a just encouragement. Uh, look in the mirror. You're not what you were 20 years ago. So what you say. I look at that every day and I think 20 years ago I'm here. I don't have hair now. I don't have the wrinkles I have. We change. Life changes. Kids grow up. Churches change. If they don't change, they die. And so change, I had a motto in my office in my church in Austin that said, constant change is here to stay. We change all the time. Then in Romans 14, 19, it says, pursue the things that make for peace. Pursue them. Run after them. If you want peace, go after it. Make changes to bring peace into your life, into your relationship. That may mean to slow down. That may mean to take some time to just be with the Lord, in prayer and devotion. That may mean some other things. You see, peace is a result of positive activity. It needs to be worked on. You can't take a magic wand and wave it over the Middle East. And just hope that you know what it will all work out. They'll find a way. Well, they won't. They never have. I don't think they ever will because there's so much animosity. But you just can't wave a magic wand over your problem and hope that peace will come. You've got to work at it. There's going to be peace in Ukraine. Only the well. Let me say this before I kind of conclude here. You only get peace when the issues are settled. You only get peace when issues are settled. In Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 8, there's a famous line. Jeremiah is the prophet, the weeping prophet. He's in captivity with the rest of the people of Israel who disobeyed the word of the Lord. They were warned. You stop disobeying, you stop disobeying, you'll stay in the land. If you keep on doing that, you'll end up in captivity. And they did. And Jeremiah goes with them. He's there. 
And then all the prophets there, the false prophets in Israel, are saying, hey, you know what, it's, it's all going to be fine, you know. You don't need to do anything, you don't need to repent, you don't need, need to say sorry to God for disobeying your word. And in the middle of that whole mess, Jeremiah stands up and says this, pointing his finger at those false prophets in Israel and says, you have healed the heart of my people slightly, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. It's like Neville Chamberlain came out that plane from Nazi Germany holding up that piece of paper saying we're going to experience peace in our lifetime and guess what happened? World War II. And Jeremiah is saying you're, you're, you're promising peace but there's not going to be peace because you haven't healed the heart of my people. You haven't repented. Peace is a result of settling issues. If there's going to be peace there, only the issues are settled. There's going to be peace in the Middle East. Yeah, only if the issues are settled. Will there be peace in the US? Only if the issues are settled. Will there be peace in my marriage, my family, my church? Only if whatever the issues are that are preventing peace are settled. That's why when counseling people have fallen out with each other, they've got to talk out the issues. Accept responsibility and repent and say sorry. I've seen it so often times that you know I would dis agree to disagree and not even shake hands and walk away thinking that the relationship's going to be restored, and it never is. Never is. Will there be peace in my heart, my mind? Yeah. Only if the issues, whatever those are, in your heart, mind, or cell before God. Philippians chapter 2 verse 2 it says this, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the same spirit, not one mind together. That's God's picture of the church and of the world, it should be. And we have the same mind, we have the same love for each other, united in the spirit, we're intent on the same purpose. And that's what keeps a church, a society of diverse people together. It's an atmosphere of peace and joy. That only comes from the unity of the Spirit. And that's why it's so important when we're looking for peace in our life that we don't think that we can engineer it all by ourselves. Even a broken relationship with someone, whoever that may be, whether it's your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your kids, your friends, church members, you know what? The only way you can deal with that is by being humble. By being honest, and more than anything else, by being prayerful. Before you launch out to try and make peace in that situation, go to the Lord. Lord, help me. Help me to say the right thing. Help me to have the right approach. Help me to have the right attitude. Help me to come humbly before my friend or whoever that is, so that peace can be made. And I'll guarantee you something if you go with that approach, and the Holy Spirit gives you that ability. There are four steps to living in peace. First one is making peace with God. That comes through repentance and faith. It's the only way. Secondly, we allow His peace to rule and reign in our lives. And then thirdly, we live our lives in a peaceful way. We resist the temptation to rock the boat, to stir it up. And then the fourth part is once that we have established peace in our hearts and our minds and our circle, then we become those people who are blessed by the Lord, and that is the ones who are peacemakers. That when we see others in turmoil, others who are having relational issues, others who, whatever's going on in their life, and rather than being people in the sidelines, we become peacemakers. But we can only do that when this peace reigns here and here and in our circle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words. We just ask you, Lord, that you would enable us, Lord, whatever situation in life is right now, to know your peace. And Lord, not only to know it, but to practice it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.